It's a dynamic question. Could you stop a murder years before it ever happens? Cutting edge science right here in the Bay Area aims to detect brain patterns that could help identify who might be at risk of committing violent attacks. Senior investigative reporter Bagad Shaban has the story. Raja Anusha, the research centers around the mind of a murderer. Scientists are trying to understand what makes someone not only think about violence, but also act on it. The answer might be all in the brain. Seven people gunned down last month in Odessa, Texas. 22 people shot and killed just a few weeks earlier at a Walmart in El Paso. Here in California, three people, including two children, died at a mass shooting at the Gilroy Garlic Festival in late July. More than 17,000 people are murdered in the U.S. each year. Now, two scientists, one in Palo Alto, another in Albuquerque, New Mexico, believe they can stop the killers before they pull the trigger. You can intervene. You could perhaps avoid the, the, the dire consequences. Dr. Hans Vogel is the director of neuropathology at Stanford University. Is there a specific part of the brain that actually triggers a mass shooter to act? I think we're getting, getting there uh, in terms of uh, finding uh, areas of the brain that may explain homicidal behavior. At Stanford University, on the second floor of a research lab, behind this door and inside a locked cabinet is some of Dr. Vogel's most infamous work. Inside is the brain belonging to Stephen Paddock. He was the gunman in that Las Vegas mass shooting two years ago that left 58 people dead. I was asked to, to diagnose and rule out certain disease processes that might have contributed to his behavior. And so they leaned on you to determine whether something in his brain may have led him to commit that act of violence. Yes. What did you find? He took his own life uh, with a bullet wound to the, to the back of the brain, but it still left a considerable amount of the brain that was amenable to, to examination. In the shooter's brain, Vogel found large amounts of what could be described as a type of scarring of the brain tissue. Diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's can cause that, but pinpointing exactly how or even why it forms remains a mystery in modern medicine. The quasi-scarring process in the brain uh, was higher than the average 60-something-year-old male, yes. But the significance of it is totally unknown. So whether or not it could have played a role in his behavior that day, we don't know. Don't know. That sort of scarring was spotted on parts of the brain responsible for fear and memory and in other key areas of the brain. It's linked to parts of the brain that have to do with emotion and anger and so forth. And decision making? And decision making, yes. The frontal lobes are, are very interesting and they're very complex in humans because they involve a balance between restraint and initiative. More than a thousand miles away in New Mexico, cutting edge research inside prisons is revealing even more about the minds of murderers. For such a big problem, it's really surprising that this is the first study of its kind. Dr. Kent Keel specializes in studying psychopaths. He's a neuroscientist and psychologist. He and his team designed a mobile brain scanner and drove it across the U.S. to study inmates at 10 prisons. Over the last decade, he's conducted MRI scans of nearly 1,000 prisoners in order to examine the brain differences of killers versus non-killers. There are regions of the brain in individuals who have committed homicide that truly are different. Keel and his research team found the brains of killers are wired differently. Specific sections of the brain responsible for controlling emotions, impulses, and social awareness are less developed among those who have taken a life. We're finding for the first time that they are quite different. And so now it's a question of how did they get that way? How might we understand this information? Keel says therapy or even medicine can physically transform the brain to reduce the risk of dangerous behavior. We're going to try to implement treatments that we know work on those systems of the brain. Then we would hopefully see changes that would then prevent these types of things from ever happening. Keel believes some people are born with those brain differences. 
And while that doesn't necessarily mean they'll commit murder, he says his research reveals some strong connections. Understanding who might be at risk could eventually help in literally changing people's minds. Dr. Keel is already getting requests from parents around the country who want their kids tested for potentially violent behavior. Now, the scans and analysis run about $10,000 per child. This type of examination does raise some ethical questions, but it could very well be years before this kind of testing becomes widely available here in our area or at other medical centers across the country.